Hi, I'm Jackie Stapleton and welcome to Atoll TV. If you've made it here, it means that you might just love ISO standards as much as I do and are truly interested and possibly excited about learning more about them. Well, you have come to the right place. video I'm going to cover clause 10.2 incident nonconformity and corrective action. I'm going to break this clause down and turn it into something you can all understand. You'll then be able to apply this to your own organization system and understand what the requirements will look like for you. No more guessing. Keep on watching as I can show you just how easy this is. Before I get started on the clause, I think it's important to understand the definition of a nonconformity and an incident. After all, if we don't know how to recognise one, then we won't know when to take action, will we? Referring to clause 3 of ISO 45001 states that an incident is the occurrence arising out of or in the course of work that could or does result in injury and ill health. So if an event occurs while we are at work and we are injured or become sick, this is considered an incident. Then the definition for a nonconformity states that it is a non-fulfillment of a requirement and the definition of a requirement is a need or expectation that is stated, generally implied or obligatory. So these requirements that we are bound to conform with may come from our customers, product or legal requirements, ISO standard requirements, or even our own OH&S management system requirements. Put simply, we need to identify and understand what our requirements are and then follow them. When we don't, that is a non-conformance. This will now help us as we move through the clause requirements, so let's get started. Let's take a look at what clause 10.2 wants us to do. The clause starts off with stating that the organisation shall establish, implement and maintain a process, including reporting, investigating and taking action to determine and manage incidents and nonconformities. When an incident or nonconformity occurs, the organisation shall A, react in a timely manner to the incident or nonconformity, and as applicable, 1, take action to control and correct it, 2, deal with the consequences. This action and dealing with the consequences can be referred to as the action. This is the first step we take to deal with the consequences of an incident or nonconformance. So if it is an incident, it would be managing an injury, isolating the area or machine that may have caused it and so on. Basically mop up what's happened and put some actions in place immediately to ensure nobody else is injured. This is not the long-term fix or corrective action. It is just getting it under control initially. The next part of the clause is where we look at the long-term fix or corrective action. Therefore, this clause states that the organisation shall B, evaluate with the participation of workers, so see clause 5.4, and the involvement of other relevant interested parties the need for corrective action to eliminate the cause or causes of the incident or nonconformity in order that it does not recur or occur elsewhere by one, investigating the incident or reviewing the nonconformity, two, determining the cause or causes of the incident or nonconformity, three, determining if similar incidents have occurred, if nonconformities exist or if they could potentially occur. You will have noticed that the overarching goal is to prevent the incident on nonconformity from recurring or occurring elsewhere. And this is done by reviewing and analyzing the incident or nonconformity to determine the cause or causes. By doing this, we also have the opportunity to find out whether there have been similar nonconformities that have already occurred or have the potential to occur. For example, if a nonconformance has been raised several times at different locations for workers not wearing the required PPE, this may indicate that the root cause has not been identified and appropriate corrective action implemented as the issue continues to recur. 
This could be further exacerbated if an incident occurs and the investigation identifies that the correct PPE was not being worn. The intent is to investigate, determine the cause and then implement corrective action to prevent the non-conformance or incident from happening again. Not only where they were identified in the first place, but in any other location or situation as well. This all feeds nicely into the next set of clause requirements, which are C, review existing assessments of OH&S risks and other risks as appropriate, C, clause 6.1. D, determine and implement any action needed, including corrective action in accordance with the hierarchy of controls, C, clause 812 and the management of change, see clause 813. E, assess OH&S risks that relate to new or changed hazards prior to taking action. So this is building on the steps I talked about earlier of identifying the cause and implementing corrective action. It would be beneficial as part of the investigation to determine whether the potential OH&S risk had been identified as part of the proactive process of hazard identification. Meaning, did the business identify that there was a risk that workers would not follow the requirements for wearing PPE? If it wasn't identified, part of the corrective action should loop it back to be included. And if it was identified, what controls were to be put in place? These controls should follow the hierarchy of controls, which is covered in clause 812, so be sure to check that video out for more details. Then finally, when new or changed hazards are identified, be sure to assess these so you understand the level of risk and impact if they do occur. To understand this more, be sure to take a look at the video for Clause 6122, Assessment of OH&S Risks and Other Risks to the OH&S Management System, which leads us into the next part of this clause where it states F, review the effectiveness of any action taken, including the corrective action, and so not only do we implement the corrective action, but we should also be giving it sufficient time to be followed and used so that we can review whether it has effectively prevented the issue from recurring. Therefore, in this example, you would continue to monitor the use of PPE across all locations. Determine if the corrective action you put in place is actually working. If it isn't completely, you might tweak the corrective action or ask for feedback from workers as to what is working and what is not working. You will continue to monitor until you are getting feedback and evidence that PPE is being worn to requirements and there hasn't been any follow-up non-conformances raised. Then the final point G, make changes to the OH&S management system if necessary and corrective actions shall be appropriate to the effects or the potential effects of the incidents or non-conformities encountered. These couple of points are saying that when there has been a non-conformity, does this mean that there are additional risks or opportunities that may have been missed in your initial assessment of the process or operations? And if so, does this change your OH&S management system and associated procedures? This provides that final loop back from an operations level up to a systems level. And of course, the corrective action taken should be at a level that is suitable for what actually occurred. For example, a corrective action of firing all of the workers for not wearing PPE the first time it has occurred may be a little over the top and not proportionate to the actual issue and in particular, even the root cause. The final section of this clause states, the organisation shall retain documented information as evidence of the nature of the incidents or non-conformities and any subsequent actions taken, the results of any action and corrective action, including their effectiveness, and the organisation shall communicate this documented information 
to relevant workers and where they exist, workers' representatives and other relevant interested parties. Okay, simple. Any incidents and non-conformities identified need to be recorded as to what they were and what actions were taken, including the results, successful or otherwise, of the corrective action taken. This is normally in the form of an incident report, incident register, non-conformance report, and non-conformance register. You can call it whatever you want, and you could combine the reporting and registers for non-conformances and incidents, as long as it does record this information at a minimum. Other information that this register might also include that is helpful is who is responsible, created or occurrence date, the due date for corrective action, the due date for review of the implemented corrective action, any links to photos or investigations, identified by category, so which might be internal audit, external audit, daily operation, a customer complaint, and so on. These are just a few additional fields that I have come across that help with analysing ongoing improvements. This then makes it easy to communicate to workers and any other parties that may have been impacted by the incident or non-conformance or will be impacted by the corrective actions. Now that I've explained all of these requirements, can you see more clearly how you could action and demonstrate these requirements in your own management system? Thank you so much for joining me. Clearly, you are truly dedicated to learning more about ISO standards. I love having you learn with me and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Auditor Training Online is a recognized training provider and we know how it works in the real world. So we are confident that we can help you to make a change in your life and join the most sought after profession out there. Go to our website and enrol in our training to transform your work and industry experience into a recognised qualification and career. And also, don't forget to subscribe to Atoll TV and leave a comment or question as I truly do want to help you to join the best career out there with